How you guys doing? My name is Mike Inez. I uh, play bass in the rock band Alice in Chains. Uh, here, sitting here at the Municipal uh, Auditorium Arena over here in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, yeah, just a crazy day. Welcome to my crazy day. <laughs> See, I guess I should start at the beginning. Um, I uh, got into music very early age. Uh, I come from a, the, it's, it's funny, the whole spur of my family is, is all musicians. Uh, I had both of our, uh, my, my grandparents, uh, on, on my mom and my dad's side are ministers. And so I grew up in a really good church family. It had a lot of, um, just had a lot of, uh, you know, everybody played an instrument of one sort or another, you know. And uh, I, I actually came out of the womb, as, as the, the story that my grandma says is, uh, out of the womb where she was, she was in the delivering me. She was a nurse at San Fernando Hospital in uh, San Fernando, California. And I came out of the womb and, and uh, went home to, we were all living at my grandma's house at the time. My uncle Matt Inez had a uh, top 40 band at the time, his high school band. And in that band was, uh, was uh, three guys from Earth, Wind & Fire. So it was pretty wild. I came from the hospital straight into a live band situation, you know, which was like, you know, two or three guys from Earth, Wind & Fire. And, uh, it's just, uh, so that's pretty much my, how I got into the music business, straight into a live rehearsal. I remember my grandma was yelling at everybody. She says that, uh, you know, hey, shut the hell up. The new baby's home. You guys got to rehearse, quit rehearsals. And, uh, you know, from there, just uh, jamming with all of my old Filipino relatives. Uh, they they uh, kind of treated me like slave labor. They t taught me how to play a G chord on guitar and a D chord and a C chord. And then that's one of the first things I learned. And, and come, come to think years later now that they were just using me to practice their mandolin solos, you know, using me as slave labor. <laughs> the first instrument I ever really grasped onto besides guitar was uh, was clarinet. I remember sixth, seventh grade, uh, started with clarinet. I actually wanted to play drums, and my father was the one. He just didn't want to have a, a drummer in the house, you know, so he, he said, oh, I think you should do something more musical, Mike, instead of just beating on stuff, you know, and was, he, he come to Later, years later, told me it was just because he didn't want to hear drums in the house, you know. But thank God he made me change the instrument because I, am the shittiest white boy funk drummer you ever, you ever heard. So <laughs> I got my one beat, so that turned out good. But uh, yeah, I started uh, clarinet, saxophone in uh, marching band and concert band and um, jazz band in high school. And uh, yeah, I was playing rhythm guitar in a band, and uh, my uncle, my uncle. Uh, uh, had a guy who owed him some money, so he gave him an old Fender Telecaster bass back in the day. And uh, so he sold it to me for like 125 bucks. I wish, wish I had that sucker. It's probably worth a fortune now today. But uh, so I started plinking around, playing along the Deep Purple albums, Led Zeppelin, the Who, Beatles albums, stuff like that. And uh, so that started me down the bass track. And then a couple bands later, I, I uh, went to this audition for the Ozzy Osbourne band just to go jam with Ozzy Osbourne. I was about maybe 22, 21 years old and uh, just went down there, not even nervous. Didn't, I had a LA Kings hockey jersey on and uh, some ratty Levi's and I just went down there to jam with Ozzy one time and, and uh, Frank Zappa's place, Joe's Garage back in the time when Frank was still alive and it was just really amazing to walk into the scene and yeah, there was every kind of shape and size bass player in the room, you know, in leather pants and guys that were older than me, so I, I, I thought for sure I'm never going to get this gig, you know. And then, uh, yeah, so I jammed some, some I Don't Know and some Crazy Train and all that stuff, and I was walking back to my truck. I was working in a warehouse at the time, and uh, so I was late for work and walking back to my truck, and I look in the rearview mirror, and I see Ozzy and Sharon running down the street, and I said, hey, you almost got away, you know, you're one of the top five, you know, I want you to come back tomorrow and keep trying. I was like, holy shit, now it's for real, you know, it's like, uh, but if I would have, if I would have left maybe 30 seconds earlier, I would have just missed that gig. You just never know what's around the corner there. And, uh, yeah, so next thing I know, two weeks later, I'm living in a castle in Ireland with Ozzy Osbourne and playing Wembley Arena. You know, it's just like my, my first gig. I, I never did the band tours. And like you hear all the guys talking about, you know, I just got really lucky and blessed. And uh, yeah, so that, that led me, that was, I think 1989, 90. And then that led me to, uh, you know, of course, meet Thousand Chains guys, late 92 and uh, joined their band officially in early 93 and um, yeah just uh, been rocking with them ever since you know it's still after 20 
20 years of doing this, uh, just to, the, the most special part for me is actually getting on the bus with my two best friends and still doing this after all this time. It's just a really amazing, uh, uh, amazing lifestyle for sure. I mean, we get to see, uh, I mean, even at this 20 years in, I'm still playing cities and countries I've never been to. We just got back from uh, Budapest, Hungary, and Warsaw, Poland. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not for everybody, but it's certainly a vocation. I, I, I'd like to recommend for young musicians out there, it's still a whole lot of fun to get out there. and uh, We respect our craft a lot, especially now more than ever. And uh, yeah, we just put a lot of heart and time into this thing and uh, just uh, brings me to Nashville today. So I'm just very blessed by this whole process. My advice would be to uh, just just really respect the craft of, of being a bass player, you know, and, and really putting time and learning your modes and unlocking those modes for yourself. And, uh, and I know at the beginning it certainly seems like a Rubik's cube, you know. It's like uh, just get the get, unlocking the modes was just such a real, um, real big step to to being fluid on your neck. And I, I guess what I'm saying is just be really uh, conscious of the craft of being a bass player and being a musician. I see a lot of guys out there today that they're more concerned about all these ego battles within the band and how they look and how much money they're making and, and stuff like that, but I don't see them sitting at home practicing their instrument a lot. You know, it's, I think it's very important for young people to really dive into it. Um, my work ethic is the same as my mom and dad. My, my mom's a beautician still to this day. She's at work right now. And uh, my father's a washer dryer repairman. And, uh, you know, so I always came at it like a blue collar kind of attitude. I, I just put my hard hat on every day and go to work and, and I just try to keep my head in a good place and drag my old bones up there and <laughs> basically give myself shaking baby syndrome, head banging all night. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, for, for me growing up, it was always like a lot of English bass players were the guys I, uh, I grew up listening to. My, my favorite bass player in the world is uh, uh, passed away now. His name was Dee Murray of Elton John Band. And uh, not many guys know about this guy. In fact, uh, David Johnstone, the guitar player, said he's working on a documentary of D that we're going to be involved with and stuff. And uh, uh, just a great, great bass player, but real inventive with his lines without being over pretentious. You know, he was never the guy trying to prove how good of a bass player he was. He just wrote the tastiest lines and uh, with a kind of a minimalistic approach to it. You know, he'd pick a whole note and it'd be the right one. It wouldn't be your basic root note, you know. And, he, and the guy sang like a bird. I uh, grew up with John Entwistle. Uh, Geezer Butler, a lot of the heavy rock stuff coming out of England. Um, Led Zeppelin, The Who were really instrumental for me. And so it's, those were really good bass players for me to kind of sit there and pick apart their lines, you know. Um, Elton John actually played on the new album we have, Black Gives Way to Blue. Uh, Jerry wrote a song about, our wonderful guitar player Jerry Cantrell wrote a song, a goodbye song to Lane. And Elton was like, I must play on this recording. And so, uh, so we went down and jammed with Elton John. and. That was really cool. So I got to ask him all these questions about Dee Murray and really get into it. You know, I mean, he's this unsung hero for me that nobody knows about, you know. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, from that, it was all into, you know, metal after that. We started getting into, you know, your Metallicas and, you know, heavy Aussie records and ACDC. And that's all my high school bands growing up, you know, so. Which wasn't a great time for bass players. There wasn't a whole lot of good bass players back then, you know. Like, uh, I mean, there, there were great bass players, but there was all root note stuff, you know. I was kind of always looked at it like a more melodic approach, you know. Uh, even to this day, like Jerry will show me a riff or something, and we're try to figure out a bass line for it. But I always overplay. I, I look for every note possible on the neck and then scale it back, you know, as opposed to doing it from the other side of it, you know. Just pick, find the right notes, real tasty stuff, and I uh, hope, anyways. <laughs> you know? But uh, it's just a good time. I, I just really, um, God, I just, I, I love playing the bass so much. That's my favorite spot on the, on the earth, especially if we're, uh, like we're playing a nice arena tonight, but especially some of these stadium gigs in, in, in Europe, there's nothing like walking up the ramp and uh, just feeling that energy, walking up that ramp and grabbing my bass and looking out there and seeing, uh, you know, 125, 140,000 people looking right at you, you know, and just, just you know, hitting the bass, slamming a bass chord and hear, hearing all those speakers moving. And, still just like the, the best possible thing I could do in my life. You know, that's the spot that I just, uh, just that's, that's like our spot when we're on the deck. You know, we take it very seriously and we just uh, can't even explain to you uh, how much joy we still get from making music together. And I think that's the, I think we're in it for the right reasons. You know, I mean, um, 
you know, my grandfather on his, on his deathbed after I got the Aussie gig, he says to me, uh, uh, you know, you got the gig by being yourself and uh, don't worry about the money and stuff and just keep getting better at the craft and eventually it'll pay off for you. And, you know, I, I wasn't expecting a 20 year career out of it, but I've always kept that, uh, you know, that, that my grandpa's words to me through the whole thing, just trying to keep a good head about everything. And, I really respect the craft of making music. I can't stress that enough, you know. I mean, it's not for everybody. Uh, I know great musicians in Los Angeles where I live, and they're, they're just phenomenal players, but you get them on the road and they come apart in two weeks, you know. So there's different aspects of music. It isn't just what I do for a living. Um, you know, we've, we've done um, like movie soundtracks, and uh, when I was playing bass in the band Heart, that was really good and musical for me to play more acoustic kind of stuff. and. Uh, scoring some Cameron Crowe movies uh, with my friend Nancy Wilson. She was the one who scored the, the, her her uh, husband's movies, and and uh, so it's 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 really nice as a player to round me out to do all this different kind of stuff. Whether it's playing on uh, like a Motorhead record, let me ask me to play on a Motorhead record. But then on the other side of it, you know, I could go play with Anne and Nancy with Heart and do really a delicate kind of music, and it's all just like coagulated. To, I guess my own style. I hope you know, but. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, whether it's doing, doing movies or, or, or teaching, there's so many unsung uh, bass teachers out there that are really just talented people, you know, so um, don't be discouraged if you get in a club band and don't take it to the next level. There's still, music is just, brings me such pleasure and joy, you know, I just couldn't imagine uh, not playing music for a living, you know, so if you're going to do it, make sure that it's in tune and uh, bring it, put it up the flagpole, let's see what you got. <laughs>